Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's DevOps.com program, brought to you by TechStrong and Digital AI. My name is Cody J. Brown. I'm the host of TechStrong Learning, and we have an exciting program ahead. First, I do need to cover just a couple of housekeeping notes. Today's session is being recorded. So if you miss any of our discussion, maybe you'd like to rewatch or share with a friend. The on-demand recording will be made available shortly after we conclude our live session today. If you have any questions, and we really hope that you do, we want you to send those in to us using the Q&A tab on the right side of the screen. Over on the right side of the screen, you'll also find a couple of other options. First, there's the chat tab, and we'd like you to reserve that for more general comments. Let us know what role you play in your organization or maybe from where you're tuning in. And if you navigate to the handouts panel, you'll find that there are a couple of uh, resources there available for you to download. So feel free to grab those. And of course, before we close out, we are giving away four $25 Amazon gift cards. So be sure to stick around for the duration of our program today. So our topic is results of the 16th State of Agile survey. And joining me is Joyce Thompson, Director, Analyst, and Public Relations at, direct, uh, sorry, Director and of Analyst and Public Relations at Digital AI, and Mark Danziger, Senior Director of Agile Delivery at Eliasson Group. So Joyce, Mark, thank you both so much for being here with me. I'm gonna let you take it from here. Hey, thanks for that introduction, Cody. That was great. I don't know about you, Mark, but I am ready to dig into this information and uh, get going. How about you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is going to be this is going to be interesting and fun. So, so let's have at it. All right. So, really, the purpose of, of this today is to go over the highlights, the things that that Mark and I found most interesting about this study that we wanted to bring up with you. Um, if you really want to get all of the details, we'll ask you to, to download a copy of of the uh, the survey results, um, and then you'll get more of the details. What we're going to go over today is essentially the same setup we have in the survey results. What's trending? What are some of the company experiences with Agile? What we found is working well. What we found is not working quite so well, and and a look ahead at at what's next. And I just want to start out by saying the reason that we keep doing this, and we've been doing this for 16 years, and the reason we keep looking at Agile is Agile is still a really important uh, phenomena, if you will, right? I don't want to label it as, as a methodology or as a tool set. It's, it's a phenomena. And, you know, one of the first things we found out is that 89% of high-performing Agile teams they're high performing because they have people centric values, because there's a clear culture, because they're using the right tools and there's leadership empowerment. And those are things I think that all of us want in our work. So I just wanted to sort of set that tone as to this is why we continue to do this because it's a lot of fun. So let's, let's dig into this and let's look at what's trending. So the first thing we see is we asked folks how they prioritize implementing their agile practices. And sort of the top answers we got were accelerating that time to market and then delivery predictability and, and lowering risk. So, so I'll start out by saying, Mark, what did you think when you saw these answers? So it was fascinating to me because if you looked at the answers from last year, right? Yesterday, I, I, I went back four or five years, you know, and just sort of scanned all the old ones. Last year, the one that was really the top of the pile was having the ability to enhance our ability to manage changing priorities. Mm. So I think, you know, that my sense is that was kind of a hangover from COVID and the fact that a ton of companies were making ma massive pivots, right, in, in response yeah. to COVID and what was going on with supply chain disruption and work from home and everything else. And, and what we find is that organizations that are more agile are further down the agile path are better at doing that. We had a client who was a big global company. And when COVID hit, it was fascinating that the business units that were further along in Agile had a much, much easier time pivoting and dealing with the response to COVID than the ones that weren't. Oh, that's really this interesting. This year, but this year, that's not a priority. And the thing I immediately thought of, there was a headline yesterday in the Wall Street Journal. Um, Disney says that profit is the priority or Iger says that for Disney, profit is the priority, the new CEO of Disney. And my sense is that we're moving into a period of time when kind of business fundamentals are driving 
And every one of these things is something that drives business fundamentals and profitability. Hmm. All right. Well, there's an answer to that one. And yes, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's onward. It's good things to think about. Yeah. So more of what's trending is we were really trying to understand what's driving agile penetration, right? And so we gave people two options. We said, are you doing agile primarily because you want to do IT and software development? Yeah. Or are you really starting to use agile for company-wide digital transformation and all that that implies moving it, you know, beyond traditional agile start teams? Or is it both? And overwhelmingly, the respondents said it's for both. <clears throat> So I think it's really interesting that we're seeing that we're in an age now where agile is not just for software development. Yeah. And I think, I think what's happened is we have a really well-worn set of paths around doing software, building software with agile. And yeah. I think that, you know, I use the phrase, the low hanging fruit has already been picked um, folks doing that are mostly kind of already doing that for better or worse. I'm not saying there's not a chance to improve or that they're perfect, but we're seeing other groups within organizations that see the lift that IT got out of doing it. And they're saying, well, we want that lift too. Mm -hmm. And as digital, and I, I, I wince when I say digital transformation a lot because it means so many different things to so many different people. It's one of those words, you know, it's like we need to solidify around what it means. But what I think we're talking about is companies realizing that every company is a tech company. Ford is now a tech company, right? Technology is deeply embedded in every product they sell and in everything they do to make products. And as a consequence, that's why they kind of wind up need to partner technology and technology practices with business and business practices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So with that in mind and seeing that, that teams are, are doing both, we asked them how are agile teams measured? And really, are you being measured by on-time delivery, which would be a delivery goal? Or are you being measured by business objectives achieved? And it's really interesting how both of those came up and they're both fairly close, but there's still a tendency towards the on-time delivery. But I mean, I would have I would have lost a lot of money betting on this. Um... Because, you know, I tend to think that most organizations are, are caught in a little bit of the feature factory mode, which mm -hmm. is what on-time delivery kind of, you know, as a metric really represents. And I yeah. want to point out to the audience that this graph's a teeny bit misleading, because if you look at it, it starts at 42%. <laughs> and actually, these numbers are very, very close to each other. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I work with clients to get them to talk about business objectives and have teams be measured on business outcomes that they're accomplishing. And the fact that almost half of the people you surveyed are already doing that kind of floors me. And it's very exciting. I mean, it's yeah. a very, very positive indicator that people are trying to do this really in the right way. That's good news. So with yeah. that in mind, we're going to take a little look now at company experience with Agile. And we started out by by asking folks, what is the, the company experience with Agile? What's their predominant approach? And what was really interesting that came up, of course, you know, a lot of them say they're doing Agile because this is an Agile survey and we're, we're yeah. asking questions of, the, of people um, in the Agile community, of right. course. But then what was really interesting to me is 50%, so, so half of them, are saying that they're involved in a hybrid environment, which includes more than just agile. It might include waterfall, right? It might include yep. other capabilities. And so do you see that? I mean, we certainly see that as digital.ai when we go out to sell, right? We see yep. customers, especially in large organizations, having very complex environments. And and that seems to be the way it is. Are you seeing that from your angle as you approach clients as well? 100%. And I think, I think we see it in kind of there's two buckets I put it in. One of them is companies are changing to become agile. That change takes a long time. And while they're in the middle of the change during that long period of time, which can be, you know, a decade if it's a big mm -hmm. enough company, right? Some of the companies doing waterfall or doing traditional PMI type project management, some of it's doing agile. Other companies are finding that kind of 
waterfall works pretty well for them in certain areas. And, and one of the things that, you know, I am, I'm very much somebody who stands against what I'll call kind of purist agile, right? Mm -hmm. I don't believe that agile is an ideology or religion or sort of a, a teleological goal in any kind of way. I think agile is a really useful tool, but I don't use every tool to solve every problem. And so I think that one thing that this tells me as an agilist, right, as somebody who, who works in this space is we need to be better at finding patterns that work for hybrid organizations. And mm -hmm. we need to be better at sort of thinking about, well, gee, these organizations are either going to be hybrid for a long time or they may be hybrid forever, right? How are we optimizing the delivery of value for organizations like that? How are we better enabling collaboration between the the agile and the non-agile parts of the organization? How are we defining work in a way that it can be consumed by agile or non-agile parts of the organization? How are we building in the tools to measure financial results, to measure outcomes, to do this sort of stuff that are agnostic to what the process is? And I don't think that we have thought about that very much. I think we tend, uh, to, I, I think I, we tend to look at the, the non-agile parts of the organization as like the backwater and like they'll come along eventually and you know, we're gonna ignore them. And I think what this tells me is we can't ignore them. And we've gotta find a way to embrace them instead. I'm just thinking there are some people out in the audience right now who are singing preach it brother. And there are other people who are saying, Hey, wait a second now. That's right, you sure, how can you say that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, please, you know, you've got room for, for chat. You've got room for Q and A there. And in fact, I'm going to pause right here and ask the audience specifically, one of the things, words we have in here in terms is iterative. And Mark and I couldn't agree on what we thought that meant. So if you're one of the folks who would say, yeah, we're doing an iterative, iterative approach, can you write in there what you mean by it? Or, you know, um, throw out an idea if, if you're a consultant and you use that term. What, what do you mean by it? We're really cool. This is, you know, live research right here. Yeah, well. no, I mean, I'd, I'd love to know. I mean, is it RUP? Is anyone still doing RUP out in the world? Um, right. You know, my gateway drug to Agile was Steve McConnell's book on rapid application development and iterative right. prototyping. And I'm I'm sure that like other people, maybe your people are still doing that. I don't know. I'd love to find out. Yeah, let us know, please. Yeah. That's why we're here as a community. All right, we're going to talk about some of the fun stuff now. What's working well? Uh, and we really looked at you know best practices. And what was really really interesting is. For people who are part of high performance teams or who are really satisfied with their agile practices, you know, we, we and we gave them a list of things and we said, pick all that apply. So, you know, you're not going to get a number that equals to 100%. But the two that came up the most is they said high levels of cross collaboration and communication as a best practice, right? And then continuous improvement as a best practice. Now, Mark, one of the things you and I were talking about as we, we prepared to this is how people view Agile. And do they view Agile as sort of an ongoing journey? And you've alluded to this. Yeah. Or is Agile kind of this end site we're all trying to get to? Now, I, I think we kind of know where we're leaning based on the mm -hmm. last answer we saw. But, you know, these two things look to me like a journey focus. Yeah. I, you know, what do you think about that? I think very much so. I think that... You know, and I'm always wary, right? Um, I look for things that contradict my beliefs because that's the only way I actually learn anything. And and I and I try really hard to kind of break the bubble that we all live in of like, mm -hmm. I understand the world this way and I see everything through this lens. Um, I've kind of come to believe that Agile isn't a destination and talking about it as a destination is a mistake and that it really is kind of a lifestyle. Right. We want to change the <laughs> lifestyle of these organizations so that they eat better and they exercise some. And, and that's going to make them healthier organizations. And so that's all about the journey. That's all about the day to day to day to day that, that the organizations live. What's interesting to me in this, and, and I'm, I'm kind of thinking about it a bit, is that increased revenue is way, way, way down the list. And kind of value delivery and success in achieving business outcomes is way, way down the list. And I think that, you know, again, I have a drum to beat, right? This is this is the lens that I look at things through. 
I think that in this cycle, in the next year, couple years, we as agilists have to be passionately focused on that. And I think that what I would love to see is I'd love to see value delivery and profitability revenue climbing up this list because, you know, collaboration and continuous improvement are leading indicators of success, but we want to see the actual success fall out into these organizations and want these organizations to thrive. And so value delivery becomes the thing that, that really at the end of the day is the game that we measure. Yeah. And, and I think what we're seeing is that there are a few people who are starting to see that as, you know, yep. best practices to focus on that. But but I think you're right. We're at a point where most people are just learning how to work better together. And, yeah. you know, I will throw this out in in the world of COVID. It forced all of us to think about how we work together very, oh, yeah. very differently. And I think the net net is it taught us all how to work better without the traditional everybody in the same room working together. So the fact that we're seeing some of these things fairly high may still be a hangover effect of, hey, now we've learned how to collaborate remotely and we're making that a best practice. And then we'll get back to some of this other stuff. Fair comp. Yeah, that, that's absolutely, that, that absolutely makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, along these lines, we're talking about all these business needs and focusing on the business. The, the the question that we then ask is kind of how, how do you measure that? How do you know you're aligning to the business needs? Yeah. And when we saw these answers, um, it was really interesting because they came out into three three very clear tiers of, of people responding to what they were using, right? And the top things that people said were all these sort of what I call business metrics, right? Mm -hmm. um, we're using generic business metrics, whatever that might be, um, end user or customer surveys uh, or individual project you know metrics that we're doing in there. Then we saw the second tier was what I like to think of as the performance metrics mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and go ahead. I know there are people out there that are going to argue on my labels and, you know, God and, bless you. you that's, know. that's okay. The performance metrics, loosely speaking, looking at OKRs, looking at NPS scores, looking at KPIs. And then finally, we have this bottom tier that's, that's still aligned with, you know, what I call the hardcore IT metrics, flow metrics, the Dora metrics. And then, you know, not to leave it out, almost one in five folks that they yeah. still don't know, right? So did, did these surprise you? What do you think about these metrics that folks are actually using I mean, to, to align a measure? Again, I would have lost money on a bet if you'd asked me before I saw this, hmm. because the, the number of people who are tying it to business metrics is, is to me, impressively high. Um, that talks about, to me, kind of real maturity and the beginnings of, of kind of the actual practice beginning to weld in and be partners effectively with the business. And, you know, I am super impressed by the folks doing that. And I think that as a practitioner, that's where I want my customers to be. And so I'm kind of jazzed about that. I think that's really cool. Um, I think it's interesting that one in five have no clue. Right. And I think that, that, you know, one thing that I kind of realized in, in reading this is I've had sort of vague notions that we need better rubrics for sort of the delivery of value in Agile. You know, and we don't really have like a, a way we all agree sort of, you know, measuring the delivery of, out, of, of value and, and outcomes at the end of the day. And, I, you know, I think we need that. And I think we need to kind of make that widely understood through the through the community and through the people we work with. Mm -hmm. that, and and yet at the same time, I don't think you can oversimplify it either, right? It's a super so. complicated thing. I mean, it's, you know, I, I have friends who, who have worked in kind of manufacturing, you know, for a long time because I'm an old guy. And, you know, they talk about how in the 60s, you know, the management, the, the, the new hotness in management was you did all this linear algebra analysis of flow and sort of factories and supply chains. And that's how you sort of determine the value that each step sort of created at the end of the day. And, you know, are these models valuable? Don't know. But but I think that focusing on value and paying attention to value is the right thing to do. And so the question to do that, we've got to have a common understanding of what value is. And I, and I think we also have to be careful because the, the trick with metrics and value, as, as a former boss of mine once asked me when I proposed a metric and when will you stop using this metric? Yeah. And I think it's really important that 
as you said, agile is a journey. And so, and organizations have learned to pivot. And so as we're in this environment where we're seeing, you know, right now we're seeing a lot of concern about what's happening to the world economy globally. It's yep. not just one country. What we're going to measure, how we're going to stay agile, what we're going to know is the important value may shift. Oh, it's and good. so not only do we need to understand a rubric of value, but we need to hold it loosely yep. and not rigidly. Right. And and those are two different skills that I think we're all grappling with. Still. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, you know, if you talk to people 10 years ago, the key driver of value was clearly efficiency. And, and what we needed to do is build these super efficient supply chains with just in time delivery. And I can have these super complicated webs of suppliers from all over the world and they would deliver stuff, right? Whether it's a factory or a, or a business in, in some way. And they do it just in time so that I didn't have any pile up of waste, you know, in the form of inventory anywhere in the chain. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, wow, maybe that wasn't such a good idea. And now we need to turn the dial and maybe we need to value resilience a whole lot more than we value efficiency. And so you've got to be able to sort of pivot and understand what the world's demanding. And, you know, I think you can't get too tightly attached to any of these. Mm. Wise words. We're, we're looking as always, at what are the tools you know, we've asked for years? What are the tools people are using to manage agile projects? There's a really interesting mix here. And the new thing that popped up this year we asked about, and I was surprised how many people chose it, was the sort of virtual whiteboarding, like yeah. Mural and Miro. So yet another collaborative tool, which I suppose shouldn't be surprising in, in a world where we've, we've moved so much remote and virtual. But what, what is your take on some of these tools? You know, the one, that made, the one that made me grin was, was Excel, you know, and, and, and I'm just laughing because, you know, a long, long time ago doing projects, I was managing my projects in spreadsheets. And today, you know, a long time in the future, we're still managing projects in spreadsheets. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I got to say that on one hand, low tech and simple is good. On the other hand, there's got to be a better way. And, um, I think the idea that mural and collaboration tools rate so high is really notable. I think that the ability to, you know, to collaborate as well as to define and make work visible. I mean, the foundational thing in Agile is I want all my work to be as visible. Mm -hmm. I want I want to know the state of the factory floor. I want to know what everybody's doing, and or where the work is and what's going on with it. And the fact that you know people are using tools that allow them to do that works pretty well on um, i'm not sure that excel is the tool that i would i would recommend well and i think what you're leaning into there as as we're looking at this move into enterprise agility and agility is it's one thing to measure work and visibility within a team yeah. but again you know digital.ai our focus is sitting up at the team of teams yeah. right we're looking at those those complex things and so I think the same is true for Agile. If, if, if you're an Agile project manager and you're, you're, you're working in a team and that works for your team, why mess with it? But as an organization starts to scale Agile to other parts of the organization, um, you know, I've seen that within my own company of a hesitation. One group loves a tool. They suggest another division uses it. And there's some hesitation about that. There's there's a sense of familiarity, a sense of, well, we use our tool. But I think it's just human nature to be that way, right? So it's, attached, it's an interesting combination there. We get attached to stuff. I mean, yeah. I, 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 I didn't work do some work out, but I spent some time in a large computer game company not that long ago. And they had gone through a period where every team got to do its own thing. They got to use their own tools, their own dev environments, just be productive was the only, was the only ask. And at some point, and it was great because the teams were super productive and super empowered and they really felt kind of self-directing and it was terrific in that way. But then all of a sudden coordination became incredibly difficult because I had no way to pull together the data from all the teams. Right. I had no way of sharing what was going on and orchestrating the work of the teams effectively because I knew what was going on everywhere. And I think, you know, that whole thing of orchestration and harmony 
is something that we really have to look at in scaling. And one of the key elements of that is I need visibility within the entire company of what's going on. And if that's in one tool or in multiple interoperable tools, however you want to do it, you know, you have to have it. It's super important. It's like saying, I'm going to have an assembly line and part of the assembly line is going to use, you know, English inches and part of the assembly line is going to use metric, you know, and it's like, that just doesn't work well. Like you kind of need common standards all the way across. It, you know, this is an agile conversation and we do talk about DevOps later on in here, but that you've just described very beautifully the DevOps tool chain problem, oh, right? Yeah. And, and that that end to end different groups are using different tools and how do we provide that end to end visibility and end to end orchestration or whatever word you want to use um, into that and and what what really is end to end. So let's hold that thought because I think it's going to yeah. come up a couple of more times here as, as we go through these results. It's a, key, it's a key thing. It's just a problem in reality. Yeah, it, it is. And and we keep looking at different ways to, to solve it. So this is the the methodologies and processes again we look at these i'll point out they're not really shifting significantly numbers go back and forth a little bit but i don't think there's any real surprise in here do you mark um the one thing that surprises me is if i remember right last year scaled agile was at about 30 some percent this year it's 50 some percent and it, and it kind of continues you know i mean I, I fully am aware of the sort of people who run around with pitchforks and torches and, and are mad at safe for a variety of reasons. Um, but in the marketplace, right, safe continues to kind of roll up. And I think that, you know, there's a series of questions that raises that all of us kind of need to sort of, you know, face up to and deal with. Yeah. Why does it continue to work? What is it offering people? that that they need that they can't find anywhere exactly else. and right. i think right. the challenge i'll pose to the critics of safe in the audience and i'm sure there's going to be some are it is basically rather than talking about what's wrong with safe which i read all the time it would be good to focus on why it's being adopted and what alternate things would solve the problems that people see that safe is solving for them if you want to present options to safe and, and move people down a different direction you know, we, we all have that colleague who comes to the meetings and uh, if <laughs> I work within marketing and we've all got the people come in and tell marketing how to do their job every day. Yeah. Uh, but but it very quickly becomes clear there are two groups of people. There are those who just like to complain about what we did wrong. Right. And then there are those who have helpful suggestions <laughs> that you say, oh, hey, maybe we could try it that way. So, I, you know, I think what you're saying is be part of group B. You know, don't be that guy in group oh, A, yeah. right? I mean, well, I, it's I think perfectly it's fine to have a criticism, but have an alternative, right? Yeah. And, and I yeah. think that, yeah. you know, I'm not in any way claiming that safe is a be all or end all. You know, I'm I am I am framework agnostic, right? Different different problems have different frameworks that solve them. Sure. Um, but I think that, you know, the fact that safe is sort of eating the world tells us something. And we all should be listening and learning from that and figuring out. How do we how do we respond to it? Right, it, it's 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 solving a need. Let's make sure we truly understand what the need is. Yeah, that's exactly it. Thank you. All right, now we, we get into some of what I call the, the <laughs> juicier stuff. What's not working? So here's where we do get to complain a, bit, a little bit. Um, you know, when we when we look at this, what we asked people, you know, what are the most common challenges to an organization's adoptive of agile adoption of agile? And we gave them a list of a whole bunch of the different things to pick from. And the ones that came up the most, you know, 39%, so more than a third said leadership doesn't understand or puts up roadblocks. And then the other two things that came up right under that is just under a third was lack of clear priorities or direction and business teams. So we keep talking about building out the business teams. They don't understand what agile yeah. is. So, so, you know, what's your take on this, right? So I think, you know, there, 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 you know, everything, two sides to everything, right? There is the, the reason why people do things that is not necessarily beneficent. And there's the reason why they do them that we need to understand and sort of deal with. And I think, you know, leadership doesn't understand or put up roadblocks for kind of two, for really to me, two reasons. And one, I think we in the actual world need to own, which is we do not have 
good models of what leadership and management look like in Agile today, right? We have sort of vague kind of homilies about being a servant leader and about leaders, you know, removing impediments, but we don't really talk about the day-to-day -day grind of what it is to be a manager in an organization responsible for, I don't know, $20 million of spend and p &L and sort of delivery deadlines that you're accountable for and the pressures that one of these leaders are really under within the organization. And I think that we have really, really good models for what it looks like to be somebody who makes stuff, right? Those are, those are great and they work and we put them in the world and they've succeeded, right? We need models for what it means to be a manager in an agile organization that are just as strong as the models we have for what it means to be somebody who delivers an agile organization. I don't mm. think they exist. So that's, that's, that's the reason that's on us in the agile community. Leaders struggle because we live in a world where, you know, power, you know, and re responsibility and accountability, right, are tied deeply to success. And people who are more successful have more power. That's, that's kind of the definition in, in a way of success to us. And we're asking leaders to give up power, right? We're asking them to give up control. And I don't think we're clearly selling to them what they get for doing that. And I also think that, you know, leaders are typically not people who've been in the workforce for five years, right? I'm a leader in an organization. I've been here 15, 20 years. I have these patterns deeply ingrained in who I am professionally and the person I bring to work every day. And what we're telling them, right? And I'm, I'm saying this as somebody who's, you know, have I ever you know, been responsible for $100 million you know, uh, in an organization? No, right? And I'm gonna sit down with that person. I'm gonna say, let me tell you how to do your job. It's complicated and difficult. And I think one of the things I think we have to start with is empathy and respect for leaders, right? And the situations they're in. And, I, and, I'll, and, and I'm again, speaking to the agile practitioners in the audience. And the second thing we need is we need better agile models for how agile plays with management. And I think that to a certain extent, a lot of agilists just hand wave management away. And I think that that is something that managers look at and they basically go, this is nonsense. And it builds resistance to what we're trying to do. And honestly, I don't see it working. I mean, Zappos is no longer a holacracy. If Holacracy had been wildly successful at Zappos, they'd still be doing it. And so we have to deal with these questions, and I don't think we have yet. Right? This is part of the maturity hill that I that my belief is that Agile is climbing right now. So well, and I'll just point out the elephant in the room of the current situation at Twitter being a really interesting case of of <laughs> I'm fascinated. <laughs> have to deal with management. We, we don't have time for that, but I'll no, but I'm, I'm fascinated. I, I really <laughs> wish I would spend two days a week sitting in Twitter, just watching and learning because to me, this is one of the most important object lessons about what's going to work or not work, depend whether or not it fails or succeeds. Right. right? Well, the well, lessons we've... to be learned inside Twitter right now are incredible. And I'm, I'm fascinated at how it's going to come out. Um, so so my observation through time in my 20 years of sitting in business is that there will be there will be acolytes to the religions of both extremes yep. but as we've seen in agile hybrid tends to win we've seen that in the workforce right hybrids winning in the remote um that people realize that living in an extreme is not a tenable long-term yeah. uh position and that we need to go somewhere so you know, we have to bring leadership in because they're going to be there. We're not going right. to get rid of leadership and things are easier if leadership is on your side. Well, right. But I think you, you've said some interesting things that we're going to see the, the comments and questions coming through. And yeah, no. you know, this is the whole point. This, this is the whole point is let's keep this conversation going 
you know, some great conversations start when we go to the shows every year. Um, and then we turn back to our jobs and the daily grind. And here we are presenting you with some data and getting you stimulated and thinking again. But I think, you know, you've thrown the gauntlet down for, on leadership there, Mark. And yeah, no, I have. Really and I exciting think to see what, what comes of all of this, right? I am, I'm wildly curious. Um, and I want to add, there's one other thing about on this one slide that I think is super yeah, important. Yeah, yeah. I, I, in, in my kind of intro to Agile for Leaders, I have a photo with an x-ray of a broken arm. And, and what I point out is that Agile doesn't in, in and of itself solve all your organization's problems. But it, what it will do is it'll show them to you with utter transparency. You'll see them. Mm -hmm. And so Agile doesn't create the problem of lack of clear priorities and direction. But when organizations don't have clear priorities and direction, moving towards Agile will absolutely make that stand out and shine and something that you can't avoid. And I think that that's great, right? Because when you surface problems, if you're a healthy organization, we when we know about something, we fix it. And, and I think sometimes there are different people in the group who have a different idea of what the problem actually is. And just coming to a common agreement on what the problem is, oh, yeah. is sometimes worth all the effort you've done up until that point. Right? What's all, it's the whole thing about, you know, asking the right question is the key, right? I mean, yes, yes. It's the That's most important question. thing you can have. And well, let's go ahead and, and see what more questions I've got. Cause sure. I'm, I'm aware of time. Got to trigger some so, questions. Yeah. So, you know, we also asked what, about barriers to adopting agile in the organization right what what are the what are the things that stop you on the business side and again we came up with and the the, the specific numbers have vanished off this slide so apologies for that but they're in the report uh not enough leadership participation not enough knowledge about agile you can kind of see where the, the numbers are down at the bottom on the guide around 40 percent. but there were a lot of them that really came up at the top there not enough leadership participation, mm -hmm. knowledge about Agile, resistance to change, sponsorship. Now we're talking about as you're scaling it out to the business side of the organization. Yep. So I think everything we just talked about is really key there, but there's also this knowledge, you know, of, of resistance to change. And, and, you know, like I said, getting another division within your company to get the same excitement that your group might have can be a challenge. Well, people have day jobs. You know, the like I remind myself all the time when I'm working with companies that people's job isn't to engage with me and successfully change to Agile, right? Their job is to do something that relates to the, what the business of the company is. And they have a finite amount of what I call change capacity. Mm -hmm. And I think a couple of the things here are, you know, resistance to change and insufficient training to me are both tied to change capacity. Um, I have never had a client that didn't ask, gee, this is a two day workshop you want to teach on how to be a good product owner. Can you do it in half a day? I've never had a client that didn't ask to compress training in some way, shape or form. And there's always, you know, you always have to lean back and, and basically say, well, I can, but then it's just a waste of half a day because you're not going to get enough out of it to be useful. So it's almost better not to train people at all um, than to do that. And I think that you know, being aware of change capacity and spending it wisely, right? In the same sense that we ask organizations to look at their value streams and prioritize the most important things and be aware of the capacity they have to deliver. We as change agents have to be really conscious of change capacity and really thoughtful of how we burn that change capacity. Because if we burn it in the wrong ways, right, we, we use it up and then there's no more. Um, Leadership participation is my great frustration because what I see all the time is make them agile, right? Mark, I'm hiring you to make them agile. <laughs> and I'm like, mm, that's not, <laughs> you know, we're, now that I'm sort of mature in my practices, I can look and I go, well, that's not really the way it's going to work well. And, and I do a right. lot of things to try and get leaders to go first. Um, I wrote a thing a long time ago where I recommended changing the safe implementation roadmap and start with lean portfolio management at the top. And, 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 and one of the big benefits you get from that is that leaders are now dirty hands involved in agile change, right? They're doing it themselves. 
before they ask anybody else to do it. And, well, and, and I think you bring up something really important. I, I, I worked at a, a remote company. It was all remote. And the message, and we had a lot of specific ways of doing things because the leader was very, very much a proponent of virtual, of, of remote work, but, but saw that work needed to be done differently. And he also believed that it had to come from the top and it had to come down into every layer of management. And when there were issues in that organization was when a, a middle level manager was hired who didn't quite buy into it. Yeah. Um, because if you don't, if you make a change and you don't reinforce it and the top doesn't live it and breathe it, yep. then as it floats down through the organization, other people can go, well, I don't really need to do this. I don't really need to do this. And, and it worked because that CEO question, anytime somebody didn't do it, there was a direct confrontation of why was it not done in this way? There's a reason we chose yeah. this. If you're going to work with us, it needs to be done this way. For better or for worse, this is how this organization does it. So I think you're, you're getting on something key there that that leadership has to buy into this and has to start with it Yep. in order to make it continue to work. Right? Well, and I think, you know, we talk a lot about culture, right? Culture mm -hmm. will come up later in, the, in this conversation. And, you know, how does culture change in an organization? Culture culture is set by leaders. People mm -hmm. model their behavior on the people above them. And if the people above them are command and control are you know, are doing these very anti agile things, then no matter how much there's a box to check about doing agile stuff, you know, they're going to resist change in a really significant way. And, and so you've got that to have real success, right, to get to the place that we we talk about wanting to get to in the beginning of the presentation here. You've got to get leadership to actually walk walk out the door first. And mm -hmm. um, it's the most, it is so incredibly important. There's a, there's a movie about the war in Vietnam. Um, we were soldiers once. And there's a really interesting scene. And I've actually made a little video that I show leaders about it, where the guy in charge who's played by, played by Mel Gibson, the helicopters land in this little in this little valley, and he's the first person who steps off the helicopter. And then when they're leaving, he's the last person to step on the helicopter. And those are the kind of leaders who can effectively drive significant change in organizations. And if you want to be the person who drives significant change in your organization, you have to be the first one to step out the door. And there's just no substitute for that. I'm going to leave it with those profound words and go on to the next challenge, which is on the tools and, and process front. And now we're back to this idea of, of a hybrid environment. Mm -hmm. And so what's not working well is people are saying, well, we have a hybrid environment. So, you know, we've had a little bit of conversation there about maybe a hybrid environment isn't a sign of a problem so much as it's a sign of a state of being, or maybe that's just what works for that organization. But then as you start to look at some of these others, you know, not used consistently, clashes with culture, siloed teams, broken processes, some of the question comes in, is that hybrid approach causing some of these to be worse, right? How much, you know, because you just got done saying the leadership has to lead with it. It's got to come from the top. And we're saying, yeah, but there's still going to be groups that for very valid reasons may not be able to play in agile at this point. So, you, you know, what, how do we take all of that in, right? So there, there's sort of, I, I had an interesting question about this, and this is one of the things about surveys, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes we're like archaeologists where I find a rusty spoon in part of a plate and I have to kind of infer how people lived based on these two artifacts. You know, so there's a lot of that. So when, when it says that a company has legacy systems, does it mean that it has a legacy system that's part of a value stream? Right. So I have a mainframe that's that sits in one of my key value streams and mainframe programming is hard to do in an agile way or SAP is challenging to do in an agile way. Um, or does it mean that my financial reporting system 
right? Or my project delivery system are legacy systems. And so the support systems that we need to sort of manage our company aren't there at a place where we can do agile yet. And I'm, I'm kind of interested if people, you know, answered this question, you know, which kind of legacy system are we talking about? But I think well, it, again, I think that's part of that answer is both, yeah. right? But how much is it one or how much is it the other? You know, feel free here in the chat, in the Q&A to, to respond to that. What, what yeah. it, when you say legacy, is legacy more about people and process and, and structure of organizations? Or is legacy more about the systems, the tools right. you're using? Right. And, and again, I think it? what it is, is that in the same sense that I think we need to develop patterns about management in Agile, mm -hmm. we need good, healthy patterns about hybrid organizations in Agile. Right. And, and I think that, that as Agilists, we have this sort of, I, I, you know, I'm passionate about Agile. Everyone I know who's in the business is passionate about Agile. We, we love it. We see it working. We think it's good for people and good for organizations. And so we want everybody to do it. And so I don't think we've thought about what it means to live in a world where everybody doesn't do it and, and we have to find a way to interoperate. And so one of the things that I'm taking away from this and something we have to build into into our practices is the notion of you're going to be a hybrid organization for a long time or maybe forever. How do we make you an effective, dynamic, responsive organization with parts of the organization that are not working in an agile way? And what are the interfaces between the agile and non-agile parts of your organization look like? So we, we almost need to, to entitle next year's survey is finding the middle way, right? That, that, that we're really looking at it it, you know, it sounds great, like you said, to have everybody agile, but how do we begin to craft within our environment in the idea that pockets are going to be, it's the same thing with, with the DevOps tool chain, right? That's right? There's going to be a group that for whatever reason continues to use a tool and they can't really go to the tool that somebody else has decided should be the tool the whole organization is going to use, right? That there are, there are pockets that are going to use a different one. And how do we begin? What you're talking about is a mindset change, almost more than an actual, you know, physical change. How do I have a mindset that expands enough to say agile means that I have some parts that are truly agile and some that I have to sort of, you know, bring along because they're either not there yet or maybe they're not going to be. There. Well, the part of it, I think, is and, and you know, I'm going to be hyperbolic for a minute and we'll get some fun responses to this. Part of me almost wants to kick the term agile to the curb. Oh, that is bold. And and I say that because and and, and again, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a bunch of people upset. There isn't an organization in the world that has made a dollar because it was agile. No. Agile helped them do something that made them money. Right? Agile is an enabler, agility is an enabler. And the outcome that we want is we want dynamic, responsive, flexible, humane, you know, sustainable organizations, right, that can thrive in the world. And one of the building blocks, one of the little Lego pieces that goes into that is agility. But we've kind of made agility the center of everything, and I'm not sure it really ought to be. And that's going to trigger some interesting conversations in a minute. But, but let me go, let me dig into this a little more. It's not used consistently across teams. There's a joke, which pretty much everybody in the Agile community knows, which is, what do you call three Agile coaches in a room? An argument. <laughs> right. And, and one of the things as somebody who's led engagements with bunches of coaches that, that makes me sort of flatten my forehead against walls on a regular basis is the idea that I'll have five coaches who will tell five teams seven different things, right? Because do we do story pointing in this way? Do we do this? Do we do retros in that way? How do we do this stuff? And one of the things I want to say, you know, to the actual community is that on one hand, right, I don't believe there is one received truth about any of this. There's no sure. stone templates. But within an organization, I have to have interoperability. Right. I have to have an organization that functions in enough of the same ways 
right? That the teams can collaborate, that people, when they say a word, mean roughly the same thing, that somebody can go from one team to another and the practices are, are common enough that they don't have to be re-educated completely. And so part of what we as agilists need to do is we really, really need to focus a bit on consistency within organizations. And again, it doesn't have to be absolute consistency. These aren't 7-Elevens, right? I don't need a three ring binder that tells me exactly what to do when the microwave catches fire. But what I need is I need there to be enough consistency that the teams, again, can interoperate harmoniously and enable the organization to deliver that value at the end of the day. And where I don't have silo, that I'm not creating silos within the organization by having people operate in different variants of, of, of agility in ways that make them hard to, to sort of collaborate. And depending on the organization and its culture, what you're talking about is it has to be good enough. Yeah. And you're hedge, hedging on that because in different organizations and different environments and different um, industries, good enough has different meanings. Oh, yeah. Right? And I, I think we'll, good? yeah, I think I'll Am just leave it there. For the, for the 787. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Or, or, or medical I care or or a website that shows pictures of cats. Right. Right. Good enough in each context is wildly Very different. different. Very different. So, so take that, but I'm looking forward to seeing what's, what's popping up in conversation yeah. as we, as we go here. So let's, let's turn in this last section here. We're just going to look at a couple of things of, of what's next. Um, enterprise agility. I, it, it, people really want to do it. Mm -hmm. um, those who are doing it are not very few are actively doing enterprise agility. So really getting it across the organization. Um, it's not necessarily working well, but there's a lot of intention to want to do it. You know, I, I think at this point, we've spent a lot of this conversation really getting to this point, right? And I think we've really unpacked a lot of why they're slow to adopt it, um, why they're not using it fully. And I think, you know, the takeaway from this with enterprise agility is maybe is enterprise agility really about good training, making sure leadership's on board first, and then just getting to good enough, which can be, you know, I, I used to work in a company in, in, um, in DevOps, we talk about a minimum viable change in MVC, right? Yeah, like we used that. to talk in our company about an MLC, a minimal lovable change, right? <laughs> so how that. do you get to that minimal lovable change? Or how do you get to that state that's lovable, like it's good enough without getting caught up in in perfectionism and the, the religious you know, belief of, well, everybody must do everything in exactly this way, right? How do we, we find that? Well, I think, you know, I, again, the, the thing, the thing I talk, and I talk about this a bunch, right, is I think we need to, to act like we're the corner gym that's kind of helping, you know, people like me stay healthy. We're not mm -hmm. the Olympic Training Center in Boulder. And kind of everybody wants to believe that we're, we're the Olympic Training Center in Boulder and we're like, we're, we're pushing people to that last hundredth of a second in whatever event they're doing, right? And the reality is we're dealing with mom and pop, regular people who just want to get better. And, and so the whole good enough concept is vital. But I also think that what we can't lose sight of is kind of the North Star. No, absolutely not. And I think that, you know, it's funny because we teach I, I joke that we teach companies, the first thing we teach them agility is don't make fixed long-term plans, right? Make, you know, create a direction, create a North Star, create this adaptive plan that will get you there an iteration at a time and, and know that it's gonna change over time. And then the first thing we do when we get in is we build this fixed three-year plan for making them agile and defining exactly what that end state for them is gonna look like. And I'm kind of like, isn't that a contradiction a little bit? Like maybe what we need to do is follow what we teach and, and start with a North Star and then just sort of dynamically build out within the organizations ch a chunk at a time as we can and keep moving them towards that North Star and keep adapting. You know, somebody once said to me that I work with, he said, you know, the plan is nonsense. The act of planning is is indispensable. That's, right. that's a classic. And, that's a classic old statement. I want to say it's attributed to Eisenhower, if I remember right. Right, and yeah. and if and, and if you get back to what we talked about, of those two things, high performing teams do well. They collaborate, and they're doing continuous improvement. 
And we said agile is a journey, not an end state. So I think right. we're just really seeing these themes resonating throughout this presentation. But, the, but there's so, a lesson, but there's a real lesson here for both agilists and for people in organizations that want to be agile, which is yep. agile has burst the dam that tied it into IT and, and, and software delivery. Yes. Right. That that dam has been breached, right? And it is now, you know, flooding through the organization in in, in different ways. Yep. And as agilists, we need to learn these new skills so that we can talk to people who aren't software delivery people. Right. And within the organization, you need to figure out how to apply these patterns that work really well in software delivery to areas that are completely different. And, and to take what works in those patterns for these different areas, apply them, leverage them and make them work. That's great. And and I've got one last bit I want to share. This is really specific to to working with the DevOps teams. And so we're kind of getting back a, a little bit more into the technology here. But that end to end visibility and traceability from business initiative through development, test and deployment, all the way to the end users, right? That, that's what people are looking for. And then the ability to measure cycle time, wait time, bottlenecks. So everything you were talking about, about that visibility, being able to look down on the floor, these are the things that would be most valuable. These are the ways that the agile and DevOps, you know, the farmer and the cowboy can be friends. They can work together. Right. Um, but I think these two wanted improvements really are just another way of saying everything we've been saying here so far. But these don't just apply to tech. Right, right. right? If I'm a marketing division, right, wouldn't it help me to have end-to-end -end visibility and traceability Absolutely. of all the flow through what I'm Absolutely. doing? Absolutely, yes. Right? Wouldn't it help me measure to measure cycle time and find out where my bottom line? Like everything yes. here doesn't just apply to tech. No, yeah. it, it, and I think it, it applies to the business. And, and this is how you can get to business value and the proof of business value is being able to see end to end and have that visibility and understanding of, of the interrelationships and the interconnectedness. That's so, right. so, okay, there, there's a lot here. There, there, I, I, thank you, Mark, for, for walking through this, for sharing your, your beliefs, for challenging us and, and the audience, for kind of giving us some insight and, you know, you look at these numbers and you say, aha, uh -huh. and then as you start to talk with someone about them, you know, they really open up to some interesting discussion. I want no, to thank all of I'm you. Sure I'm, going to get, I'm sure I'm going to get roasted a little bit for some of the things I said, but let's learn from that. Let's, I mean, well, but, I'm being but a little you, deliberately you controversial, you. but, but I, yeah, want, to, I want to learn. I want to trigger it. discussion with this stuff. Yes, yes. And that's, that's, there's nothing worse than a webinar that gets done and everybody walks away and five minutes no, later you've forgotten yeah. it. We want to have a webinar where people walked away arguing with each other and, you know, sending letters to Mark, you know, and, and putting things on Twitter about Agile. So thank all of you. If you're still here for sitting through this, you didn't get dragged into another meeting. You're finding this fascinating. You're wishing you could jump into the room with us and have a conversation. Thank you so much. We're going to look over here now to the chat and the Q&A and see what people had to say. That's right. So you can jump into the room with us. Yes. Thank you. Thanks a ton. All right. Well, thanks. I'm, I'm glad you folks stuck around. Hopefully this isn't running into your next meeting. Uh, you know, as Cody said, I really, really wish we could just get everybody in the room, Mark, because so many people throughout this conversation have made great points, you know, sort of argued some things. So first of all, thanks for the folks who answered questions on, on iterative. That was helpful. Um, and then the next thing is, this participant 724, so you're all anonymous, you're safe there, kind of said, why are you hybrid is a really important question to figure out when you're trying to figure out where to go next. Often the why is that parts of the organization have no context or that the way Agile is presented doesn't solve their needs. Um, so, and, you know, and there were a lot of kind of conversations in here of, you know, the participant 668 said, well, you know, hybrid is really water scrum fall, right? And there were some sort of some implications that hybrid, and I'm, I'm looking at in the Q&A, some things came up here. Um, why is hybrid needed? This was participant 409. Are you still at least looking at the agile mindset? Core transparency, inspection, adaptation, 
Um, or is it a hybrid where it's truly just mini waterfall with new agile names, you know, slapped onto the top to make it look pretty? You know, the, the question is, and of course, in the depth of the survey, we don't really get to get into that very much. And so the color sort of comes in as we have these comments. But Mark, to what degree are we up in a theoretical world about what hybrid really is versus in the real world, you know, either you're doing agile or you're not, right? We, we keep talking about finding this middle way, but, you know, wh what are your thoughts on that? How much are people calling things hybrid when they're really just agile pretending or waterfall pretending to be agile? I think that's, that's a really fair question. Um, I think in the world that I've seen, and I certainly haven't seen everything there is to see. Um, I've seen a bunch. I've seen a couple different kinds of, of, of hybrid. And one of them is clearly the case where they simply relabel the job titles and the project manager becomes the scrum master, the BA becomes the product owner, and we just continue business as usual. And I'm not even going to kind of dignify that as hybrid. I don't think that that's, I think that's, that's a, you know, in the crawl, walk, run, you know, continuum. I think we're, 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 we're basically just learning to roll over. I don't think we're even at crawling yet. Um, I do think there are very legitimate cases where I have deeply hybrid workforces, where I have a part of the workforce that's functioning in a relatively traditional PMBOK, classic project management structure. And I have another part of the workforce that's working in a deeply agile, team-oriented, more fluid structure. And, and one of the things that I've kind of come to realize is there's actually some potentially legitimate arguments for that. And, and one of them I'm going to touch on is basically human, which is we all assume that everybody wants to be, and I'll use the word liberated at work. I, I used to think that my job was to basically unchain people and get them to kind of you know, be free of the constraints that the old fashioned ways of working put on them and, and let them be their full selves at work. Not everybody wants that. And I've run into a, a decent number of cases where not only middle management, not only line managers, but the people on the shop floor were like, why do you want me to do all this? I just want to do my job and go home. Hmm. And, and I think that, you know, the, the best model I sort of have is there's no military in the world that's entirely composed of special forces, which is a, a pretty good analog to sort of agility. There are militaries that have more and less of them, but the reality is that there, there, there is in most organizations a pool of jobs and a pool of people that are that want to be structured in a certain way and that maybe are better structured in a certain way. And so, you know, I ask all the time, is the real endpoint here to make everybody in every organization a fully functional agile organization? And I think in real in reality, it's not. If nothing else, because for the years and years we're going to be working to drive the change forward, we're not going to be. So how do we do that in the healthiest possible way? How do we invite people who want to be agile over to kind of the agile side of the table? How do we make these groups interoperate harmoniously? so that the, they can orchestrate their work and they can actually deliver value effectively and not get in each other's way? And how do we do this in a way that's sustainable so it can persist for a really long time? And I think those are legitimate questions and, and ones I don't think we have recipes for that are necessarily repeatable. But I think that looking on organizations that are hybrid as failed organizations is a mistaken place to start. That's probably yeah. enough and that, the yeah, and, and that leads into the next question, which which I thought was a great one from participant five five nine, and and they said, you know, what is a non agile part of this organization, right? and what specific things make it non agile, and you know th th what they're saying here is the answer to that is well, re re can't speak today, that's relevant in figuring out what to do about it. And and I sat there looking at that question thinking, yeah, that's really good because, you know, I work on a marketing team that calls itself an agile marketing team. 
um, because of the mentality and the mindset of the team and how we work. But we're not using an agile framework. We're not doing, you know, scrums or burn downs or, or any specific methodology. But, you know, we approach our work um, and the way our team is structured. So are we agile or not? I'm just throwing myself out as as an example there, right? And well, I think, I think I, that there's not, you know, there's not one right answer here. That's the other thing I want to say. I don't think there's, a, but I think it's worth, I think that's one of the really good questions, number 559. Five, yeah. I think that's a really, really good question to ask yourself as you're going into conversations or discussions, right? And and then when we get to leadership, does leadership have the same definition of what is agile um, that you as, as the, the agile practitioner do? So, so I think to answer that, you've got to ask the question of what's agile for? And I think that ultimately what Agile is for is to develop higher performing organizations, organizations that are better at whatever they do. And you have to have a certain level of humility because long before a bunch of guys got together at a ski resort and, and wrote up Agility or before <laughs> Steve McConnell wrote, you know, you know, rapid application development or before there was the new, new product development game in the Harvard Business Journal. People built super high-performing teams that did incredible amounts of work with the resources they had, and they were wildly successful. What we do with Agile, I believe, is we kind of democratize that greatness. It's a set of patterns that any kind of reasonably smart person can follow that enable you to be, you're never going to be as good as the best, best, best team, right? But you can be pretty darn good and put yourself on a path towards being the best, best, best team using these recipes that we that have been proven and that we bake over and over again and that kind of work. And so when I, when I talk about what's a non-Agile team, Agile has some pretty explicit definitions. Persistent, long-standing team teaming, very short incremental cycles of work, um, a certain kind of artifact which is used for intake. Um, a certain kind of planning that defines how the work is done, a certain set of, of ceremonies and meetings that define kind of the cycle of our work that we repeat iteratively over and over again. And if I've got a team that doesn't do those things, but is still performing pretty well, that's a non-agile team. And I, as somebody who's in the agile transformation business, but I'm really in the improving organizational performance business, need to look at with some care and go, well, do I spend a lot of time with these folks? Or do I spend time at the boundaries of what the team does and figure out better APIs, for lack of a better word, to let them play with the rest of the organization? So we have we have three questions, and I'm, I'm conscious of the time we have left. So I'm, I'm going to warn you about this, Mark, because you yeah. and I could talk for the rest of the afternoon. Oh, yeah. And two of these questions are monumental and fabulous. And I, you know, we could probably spend a whole day at any given Agile conference discussing them. So I'm going to start with the what I think is easier one first. And that comes from participant 445, who says, you know, the pandemic and the resulting lockdowns really accelerated the normalization of both remote working, which we saw in the survey, as well as on-demand talent or contingent workforce models, which is interesting. So effectively, what they're arguing is that we're seeing to some degree the commoditization of talent, right? And I think a lot of the recent layoffs in the engineering side of tech world might, you know, kind of back that up. Are the enterprise agile frameworks like SAFE taking this trend into account? And if so, how are they or will they adapt? So I don't think any of the frameworks are taking this into account yet because I think these these work trends we're just beginning to see them name them and know what they are right so there's first becoming aware of them and then there's sort of some thinking about it and some experimenting and then best practices start to emerge and i think when safe and agile frameworks bring things in that's when they've really hit that best practices level so i don't think they're ready to do that yet but i don't think having said that that doesn't mean we shouldn't be thinking about it talking about it and asking ourselves these questions so I think you I got think any thoughts on that work, right now? I think remote work is largely baked into the pie at this point. I yeah. think that pretty much every agile framework has a set of patterns that have been now around for two, two and a half years that, that engage remote work. 
Um, I think that before that, we had patterns which enabled us to engage a lot of time zone crossing um, and limits on how much time zone crossing I can do can still really be effective. Um, I think the whole idea of contingent labor and of, you know, I, I use the phrase, you know, kind of here in Los Angeles, we would call day labor. It's like the old, there, there, there used to be kind of, you know, job offices where I could go for a day and say, I'm a bricklayer. And they'd go, well, we have a demand for three bricklayers go here. Right. And come back at the end of the day. Right. And right. $20. Um, and I think that, we don't yet have a model for that. And I think it breaks a couple of the core criteria of agility, which is that I need people right. to be around for a while to learn to work together. Yes, um, the persistence thing you just spoke about, right? That, right. that flies in the face of that. Directly in the face of that. Um, but, but there's this guy named Woody Zool, who I run into all the time at Agile conferences, who talks about mob programming. And his idea is much more unstructured, unhierarchical, but it's basically, and, and we see this work because I have friends who work at SpaceX and Tesla, and this is how those organizations effectively work. There's a problem and anybody who can remotely possibly show up and contribute to the solution of the problem swarms into a room and they collaboratively solve the problem. And so it may Go ahead. You, you had something. I, 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 yeah, I don't want to cut you off. I'm aware of time. My thought on this is that one of my one of my thoughts, and this could stir the pot, or I could just be, you know, yeah, whatever. Semantic games. Mm -hmm. The definition of work is vague, and I understand that the definition of work is necessarily vague. Um, but all work is not equal, and all work does not require the same effort to figure out who should do it and how it should get done. So I'm wondering if there's a need in agile to somehow begin to think about two types of work, or maybe there's That's more. That's an interesting idea. Right? Multiple, right? multiple types of work. Yeah. That's a really... So there's what I would call, com I would call there's commoditizable work, work that you can think of as a commodity thing yeah. that any member of the team could do or a temporary person could do. And then there's the work that really does require the person with experience, with knowledge, who's working to, or the group that has that, right? So it's an interesting thing I'll throw out there. I, I think it's interesting because I think you're going to wind up mechanical turking a lot of the first class of work um, if, if GPT hasn't taken it over yet. And, and I think that we'll wind up with a lot of, of interesting models. But yeah, I think, I mean, I have a, a foundational issue, like I, you know, but my my mom's entire family were were long short and you know very active in in the union and and sort of that sort of thing and i i stress a lot about moving everybody in the world into a contingent labor pool because i think that tips the balance and scales you know very much against the people doing the work and i, yeah. I stress a bit about how we balance those scales to make it sort of fair and, and, and I use the word sustainable just in the sense of can this last for a long time or does it ultimately break? Um, but that's a well, long question. We're, we, we're not going to solve the next three minutes. No. And I think one of the areas that, that folks who are interested in this could look to is on the DevOps side, there is a trend towards automation and hyper automation, right? And the first that, you know, there's a lot of work that has been done on how do you determine which tasks are automatable? And I think you could start to take those principles and apply them to work as well. Mm -hmm. What is work that is aut automatable or, you know, can be put or maybe made contingent or contingible? Is that a word? Did yeah. I just make a word? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but you know what I'm trying to say. And then there's work that, no, don't be silly, that we have to approach it in a different way. So maybe that's a start. Um, so the last two questions are fabulous, and I'll put them out here, and you know, maybe we do follow up. Um, are, the, are the issues, challenges, and problems using Agile unique? Is there any guide that can eliminate all the issues that must be faced in Agile projects? Well, you know, that's like asking a programmer if we can get rid of all the bugs in a program, <laughs> right? It's just never going to happen. We're human beings. So the the quick answer to that second half is no, we're never going to eliminate them. And there's no guide that can help you. But 
you know, I think that the, I think what they're getting at is some of the things we're facing here aren't unique to Agile. Some of these are, are you know, are things psychologists, sociologists, anthropologists have looked at as part of the human condition. Um, but there are certainly other places that maybe we can look to that have solved aspects of these challenges. You know, one of the things that, that I was, was talking to somebody about was, you know, people who've done a lot of work, especially in business and psychology about leadership and leadership approaches and methodologies of leadership and what kind of leadership works, you know, th that plays into all of your earlier comments, Mark, about us thinking about how to work with leadership in agile teams, right? So there's an example, participant 843, um, there's not one place you can go. I wish there was. I wish I could give you a, a you know a website, send you off, and it'd be perfect. But then we'd all be out of business, so that wouldn't work. Um, but yeah. but in all seriousness, I think those are some of the places that we can start to look, right? Yeah, I think I was I was going to be a little flippant in my response and say on the shelf behind me, I know I have copies <laughs> of the Bible, the Talmud, the Quran, and the Bhagavad Gita, and I'm sure somewhere in those, you know, all the answers are contained. Um, but but in seriousness. I think I think that the thing I take away from this is something I say a ton um, and I've said a long time, even when I was actually doing real work and building stuff, is we are not the first people to have this problem. No matter what right. problem you face, it's reasonably certain that someone else has faced it first. And so I'm a thief. You know, um, I think it was Michelangelo who said all art is theft and, and all, all art is steal. And I'm a passionate believer in learning from people and stealing and looking for ideas and looking for answers and look for answers that aren't necessarily in your domain, right? It doesn't have to be an answer about how do I manage an IT organization? It could be an answer to how do I manage a soccer team, right? Ted Lasso has a lot to say to us all. How do I manage a military unit? How do I manage um, a factory floor? How do I manage, you know, a church? Right, whatever. How do I manage your middle school classroom? Exactly. That's actually probably the best example. Um, and so, and so I think, you know, there is no one ring to guide us all. And we're all kind of stuck here on our journey, you know, doing the best we can together. And the only thing I can say, and maybe this is my closing, closing beat here, is doing it together is way better than doing it on your own. And to the extent that we are parts of part of community or communities and that we can lean on each other, whether it's by throwing questions out into LinkedIn or the internet someplace, or whether it's by calling a friend or doing whatever we do, our odds of a successful solution will be greater than if we try and do it all by ourselves. That's, that's great. And I'm sorry, we are, we are out of time and I can feel Cody bringing in the image of these to bring in that hook and sort of <laughs> drag you off the stage. The what I do want to say, I'm going to throw this out here is we created a state of agile report group on LinkedIn. Just type in state of agile report. You'll see the little icon that'll look familiar for the report. So in the handouts, you should be able to get the report there. Um, go to the state of agile report group. It's, not run by any vendor. It's it's just related to this report. Um, I'll put these questions, some of them in over the next day or two. Um, come in there, invite your colleagues, invite your friends, anybody in Agile, um, and we can continue this discussion on it because I think this is the, the beauty of having these collaborative tools now is that this report comes out once a year, but some of the questions that come up, we can you know try and continue the conversation. All right. Well, Joyce and Mark, before I have to play the uh, the music they play at the Oscars to start cutting off the accepted yeah. speeches, I'm just gonna just gonna turn my mic on. But I, I really appreciate the both of you coming on here and uh, and really bringing in these extra 20 minutes of questions. I know um, I know the extra information goes a long way, and especially just what how much more you can cover in just 10 more minutes. And thank you, Cody, for giving us that space. That was awesome. Yeah, thank, of course. Thank Mark, thank you, you so and, much. And, and thanks to the audience for giving us their time as well. Yep, yes, yep. yes. Your time is your is your most precious gift, and you shared it with us, and we really appreciate it. So thank you for that. Of course, of course. Um, so just to remind everyone, this session was recorded. So should you want to rewatch or share with a friend, 
you should receive an email with a link to access the recording on demand, or you can find it living on the DevOps website at devops.com slash webinars. So quickly, I do have four gift cards to give away. These are for four $25 Amazon gift cards. And our winners are Alyssa L, Marco G, Waltrod T, and Kristen R. So to our four winners, please keep an eye on your inbox to claim that gift card. But if you don't happen to come across that email, do check your spam folder. I would like to thank Digital AI for sponsoring today's program and to everyone who's been with us for the last uh, 80 minutes. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate your time. We really value it. And we also value your feedback. So as soon as we close out, there will be a survey that pops up on your screen. Let us know what you liked about today's program. Let us know what you'd like to see or maybe what we could do better. Otherwise, we do hope to see everyone at an upcoming Tech Strong Learning program. Have a great rest of your day. And Mark, Joyce, thank you once more. Thanks a ton, everybody. Bye-bye, everyone.